Hello, my name is Grant Johnson. I'm the CEO and founder of Esports Entertainment Group, where we are building uh, the future of esports entertainment and betting. We trade on the NASDAQ under the symbol GMBL for gamble. Uh, before I get started, there's our uh, some forward-looking uh, statements. Uh, a bit of background on our uh, company. Uh, we are creating a, uh, a vertically integrated approach to the esports market where we're creating a, a safe, fun environment for players to play, watch, and bet on esports. And how we're doing that, you know, by being on NASDAQ, we have the transparency. So we have the overwatch of the, of the SEC. And also we have currently three tier one uh, gambling licenses in, uh, in Ireland, in the UK, and in Malta. And we'll have our fourth shortly here in the United States from New Jersey in our partnership with Bally's Gaming. And that will be launching live uh, this quarter. Uh, our company, what we do is we operate uh, business to consumer wagering platforms and events. Uh, we operate event venues and have all the technology infrastructure that supports those two uh, platforms. Uh, I founded the company back in 2014 after attending a championship of uh, StarCraft where I was impressed and surprised to learn that you know, eSports wasn't just the venue for teenagers in their parents' basements. Uh, I went to the championship. There's over 5,000 20-something-year-olds heavily engaged in watching this championship, and that's really where the idea started for me. I wanted to be involved in the industry. It's just, it was the next thing. Some of the uh, key statistics, of course, today we're experiencing uh, some pretty exciting activity on our, on our stock. We're up over $8 now. Uh, recent acquisitions, Argyle Entertainment, which runs Sports Nation and brought two, uh, two gaming licenses to the company and a wealth of uh, knowledge and really increased our management skills. Uh, we acquired them in July of last year after our uplisting. Esports Gaming League, which is the EGL platform, which is the platform we've been doing partnerships with the pro sports teams, the Kings, and Eagles, etc., cetera, uh, has just closed. Uh, Lucky Dino Casino is closing uh, either late this month or early next month. That is a traditional uh, gambling platform with over, uh, over 25 million in revenues. And of course, uh, the, the announcement that we see with GD Circuit Helix, which will close uh, late Q1, early Q2 uh, this year. So what is esports? Effectively and simplistically, esports is organized competitive video game play, where either teams or individuals are playing against each other in organized events for some sort of monetary prize. And of course, during this past year of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, this trend has been a, was growing rapidly previously and COVID has just accelerated that growth. Depending on where you get your, your statistics, uh, the online video game industry is between two and a half billion to three and a half billion participants. And this is mobile gaming, laptops, game stations, et cetera, of this group over 500 million of them uh, consider themselves to be esports viewers. Now, esports traditionally would be League of Legends, Dota, Counter Strike, Rocket League, etc. Uh, so the audience—it's—it's it's an educated audience. Audience. Uh, most of them are they have uh, post-secondary education, and over 43% of the households have an income of over 75,000. So it's an affluent group. Uh, this gives you a, sort of a sense at the bottom there. We have some charts there showing you the, the growth of the industry, but maybe more importantly, the chart uh, by age group, where a lot of people are uh, still of the belief this is the area of you know, young teenagers in their parents' basement. But as you can see, the 18 to 34 year old set, that represents 75% you know, of the market. And if you go older up to 35 plus, you're at 85%. So this is, these are not, uh, these are not children. This is a huge growing industry that is participated in primarily by adults. Okay, so our customer focused strategy is to basically build a machine to, to monetize uh, the, the, the gamer and, and the traditional better. So we're kind of coming at it from two sides on this. 
explain that here. So our, our strategy was first to acquire. So our M&A strategy has been very aggressive. You've seen since the uplisting on the NASDAQ last April, we have acquired already uh, three uh, operations and we're in the process of closing two additional ones. So we're acquiring pools of customers in two primary buckets, either they're gamers or they're traditional bettors. And by traditional bettors, I mean sports book bettors or casino bettors. Then we synergize these pools at, by you know, offering content and marketing strategy and we cross sell them. We learned that during COVID when sports were shut down, esports fans do bet on esports. We know that some esports fans do play certain card games in, in casinos. We've also learned that gamers who play in tournaments, once introduced and informed about gambling, will bet. So we introduce and convert gamers to esports bettors, and we introduce traditional bettors into esports betting. So then we integrate all this. The strategy is focusing on leveraging these assets and our in-house technology to basically offer a compelling experience where the customer doesn't need to go to an outside platform. If they want to watch esports, if they want to play in an esports tournament, they want to bet on esports or traditional sports. They can do it all within one family of companies. So we acquire, integrate, and synergize. So our customer acquisition, we have an M&A team led by Stuart Tilly and Dan Marks which is focusing on acquiring uh, pools of customers. And we do this through uh, our relationships in the industry. My relationship with the industry, I started in the business back in the 90s at Genesis. So I've got contacts that go back 25 years. Uh, Stuart, uh, you know, till he goes back in 2005, so 15, 16 years in the gaming industry, Dan's over five. Uh, Magnus has been in the video game sector since the 90s. So we, to give you an example, our Lucky Dino purchase, uh, we're effectively paying one times revenues. Uh, there was a transaction done last fall where one of our competitors paid six times. Uh, we feel that we have better relationships and can make smarter purchases. So this is our focus on building these large bases of customers from the traditional sports and casinos, and then take these customers and uh, introduce them to the esports. Uh, sector, as well as, you know, the acquisitions we're doing in the esports sector and they're doing some debating. So if you look down at the bottom on the gamer side, we acquired EGL. That had over 350,000 gamers that use the Turner platform. We are now introducing and educating them on the esports betting. GG Circuit has uh, 1.9 million uh, people that use uh, use their infrastructure software. Landol, which is launching next quarter, which is a player versus player skill betting platform. We've been launching in the United States next sec, uh, next quarter. Uh, Vi is our, Vi GG is our first gambling uh, platform that is relaunching in New Jersey uh, this Q. Uh, it will be going up uh, after that in the UK. And then it offers a whole bunch of new types of betting, micro betting, et cetera. Helix, uh, there's over, there's five Helix centers in the, in the US. Uh, the two biggest are in North Bergen and at the stadium at the Patriot Place. Uh, if you go online, look at Patriot Place, there's a 10,000 square foot Helix gaming center integrated into the stadium. From the traditional betters, uh, our acquisitions have been Sport Nation and Red Zone, which are the UK and Ireland, and then Lucky Dino, which has an office in Malta, where we have our headquarters, and they're predominantly focused on casino up in the Nordic region. So, we have really, our approach to this is three, three primary families of, of products. Esports entertainment group play, watch, and bet. So our goal is to keep all of our acquired customers uh, in the universe of, you know, our universe of, of sites and uh, family of companies and cross-marketing between them to maximize uh, the value of, it, of each of them. So they can come on, they can play from home, on their home computer, they can use their mobile devices to place bets or watch or participate in tournaments. They can go to gaming centers like at Helix or any of the other land centers that GT Circuit's connected to. There's over a thousand of them. Uh, and we have a plan to integrate this into land-based casinos. So in our, in our strategy of you know, synergizing uh, our, our various assets and educating and cross-selling, uh, so this is how we create our shareholder value, where we turn gamers who may be participating or watching uh, in tournaments into people who would bet, uh, bet on esports, bet on sports, casinos, and then taking the traditional bettors. And we saw this, the, the 
the genesis of this idea was back during COVID when professional sports were shut down. We saw 55% of the handle on Sports Nation uh, was generated from sports fans betting on the virtual sports, the sports they understood like 2K, Madden, FIFA, et cetera. So this is, uh, you know, our strategy is creating content to educate and cross market between the various, uh, the various platforms. So again, we maximize that, uh, the revenue from our client base and they don't go elsewhere for their entertainment. And, you know, we, we have those shows that we participate in. We did the uh, Red Bull tournament over in Europe. Arsenal, we do the, you know, the Indian Cricket League, we have live streams, there's many articles, we have our own, uh, you know, by uh, eSports is, is a content site, with articles, newsletters, the social and gaming centers, this is Helix, where the gamers come to play, you know, socialize, it's a, it's a misconception that uh, eSports fans are somehow, you know, reclusive people in, in basements around the world, whereas now we're learning, particularly with our relationship with the pro teams, Athletes are gamers, and the fans of these pro teams are also gamers. So it's you know these these are the same people. It's not some sort of new genetic mutation. Um, so for every dollar, you know that we generate currently from acquired you know, customer, we're looking to accelerate that by cross marketing across the other various uh, platforms that we have. So again, just driving home the message: you can play, you can watch, or you can bet. So that's, you know, where we're really pushing forward is bringing it to the masses, making it uh, front of mind because it's been in, in the background for, for far too long. So on the, under the eSports play services, you know, we, uh, we have a number of different ways that people can, you know, they can play. They can, if they're in leagues and they're watching, play in tournaments on the EGL platform, whether they're uh, in organized tournaments, branded tournaments from the, the pro teams, or a group of their friends, they want to get together and have their own tournament, they can set these up on the, uh, on the EGL platform, or they can come to the local gaming centers or the Helix centers, uh, where they can socialize and participate. You know, we've seen our partnerships with the pro teams, where this has come from, COVID actually accelerated this. The pro teams were already moving into the sports heavily. You know, Cuban has been invested, Jerry Jones, AEG, uh, Harris Blitzer, the Kraft family. And the, what we're doing with the Eagles, the Union, LA Kings, is we're running branded tournaments for their fans to play for prizes of that team. So they're our marketing partners, effectively. Uh, introducing their fans to our platforms. So we use all of our technologies to, to integrate this, bring them in through EGL, get them into the gaming centers, and we gather all this information. And that's where we get the, you know, the GG circuit and the, the Genji analytics come to play. They can watch the content is obviously the heart of esports entertainment. And you, you're watching your product again, if you're, if you're watching tournaments, if you're uh, watching events at, at a Helix Center, or you're watching something on by, what we're looking is educating people to be comfortable to placing bets, or joining and starting tournaments. Whichever you want to do, we want to make sure we have a product for you. Uh, through our acquisitions, we acquire an awful lot of key talent. When we acquired Flip uh, Sports, that's programmers who are dedicated to creating uh, gambling sites. EGL has got 10 years experience running tournaments with major brands like Red Bull and Arsenal. And of course, Helix, uh, they've got expertise with uh, running centers, and as I mentioned, they're Patriot Place. And GG Circuit is the largest infrastructure software um, uh, platform uh, for operating land centers. So we really enhance our, uh, our skill set with each one of these acquisitions. There's a reason for each of them. So under our bet gambling, where this is, you know, where the, the greatest amount of growth, potential growth is for us, uh, we really come at gambling from, you know, all sides, you know, traditional gambling uh, and for esports. You know, we've got event betting where you can bet uh, uh, through the buy platform, uh, sports betting on the Sport Nation platform, player versus player betting, which will be the Lando product. This is skill based. 
and that is launching that next quarter. Casino style betting with our at Lucky Dino acquisition, we will own the platform, and fantasy betting, which is being introduced to the new uh, buy brand, which is launching again uh, this this quarter out of New Jersey. So it's really uh, you know esports entertainment group betting. It's it's our own uh, in-house developed software. We renamed it uh, Codename Phoenix, and it's 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 a reinvented version of, of buy. We've taken all the things we've learned over the last several years about how gamers like to bet, and we're integrating all those into one platform. Micro bets, in-game betting, pool betting, fantasy betting, tradition, traditional betting. So that's, uh, that's all being on offer. And this is a way that we can offer product for the traditional sports bettors who like to bet on the titles that they understand, the FIFA League, the Madden, the NHL, etc. And, you know, we, by doing, uh, again, cross-marketing between the buy product, the Lucky Dino product, the Sport Nation product, and even having that Landual product, there's no type of betting that we don't have. So whether, again, you want to play, you want to watch, you want to bet, we've got the product. So the infrastructure, everything runs off our foundation of the infrastructure. We own our infrastructure through Flip, through GP Circuit, through Genji. Now we, we can track how people play, how they watch, how they bet. We get to integrate you know, by integrating uh, Genji's analytics. Uh, we can provide tighter lines for our, our eSports betting platform, and we get to collect data on how people play and how they bet. Uh, this is you know, critical. Uh, we understand our, our clients and our players. Uh, and of course, through the GD circuit, larger spectrum of uh, the larger platform where there's over, I believe there's a thousand land centers now that run off uh, GD circuit software, we can understand better how gamers uh, like to game, what they will bet on, what uh, what games they like to play, how frequently, what times. And this allows us to, you know, hone our marketing strategies, our approach. Because if you don't have the data, if you don't know how you're just firing random uh, programs into the dark and hoping they work. Every one of the decisions we make is based on knowing how people, uh, you know, engage with these games. Because of all this infrastructure, it opens up a couple new verticals for us. One that we're experiencing right now with the pro teams, where we have a B2B solution. Um, for casinos, which is some discussions have already started coming up. Casinos, I've spoken on several panels. Uh, traditional casinos are looking how to get that demographic back into their facilities, how to get that millennial uh, gamer better into their, into their physical plants. We've got the skill set now. We have the software. We have the hardware. We know what they need to bring into their, into their facilities. Uh, we've got the head-to-head uh, -head betting platform with the land duel. And, of course, with Buy and EGO, we have the online presence to collect people and push them into the physical plant. So we're, frankly, you know, we're natural partners uh, for casinos. Either they can have a turnkey solution dealing with us, or they can go have find a platform provider. They can go have an analytics partner. They can find a betting partner. They can find somebody who runs physical, and they can have four different relationships, or they can work with us. Uh, we're already seen with the pro teams. Uh, we've signed with the Eagles, the Kings, uh, and the Galaxy and the Philly Union, and we have several dozen additional conversations with teams who are also looking at how can they bring esports and use that as an entertainment tool to engage with their fans, not just in the time of COVID, but post COVID. What are they going to be doing with it? We see at Craft uh, Sports and Entertainment have already integrated a Helix Center into their facility, and we're using that as the best example of what is the future of these, you know, these big stadiums and these uh, these courts and arenas. Uh, they will be integrating esports as part of their product mix. And again, as we've just you know recently shown, we are an ideal partner for it. On our financial side, you know, fiscal 2021, 20, uh, which ends June 30th, we've got our guidance at 13 million. We'll be adjusting that when we. Uh, finalize the, the Lucky Dino and GGC uh, Circuit Helix transaction. So those numbers will be uh, increased when we, uh, uh, next month. We'll be looking to do that. But fiscal 22, once these are, these will, will of course all be integrated, our guidance is 70 million. 
Uh, currently, you know, this the graph below gives a fairly good comparable benchmarking against the other companies in our sector. And we believe we provide the best uh, investment opportunity amongst uh, those others that are in our sector. So in summary, we've, you know, we have a, a unique uh, value proposition. We have a diversified approach uh, to the sector. We have the most tier one licenses. We've got the NASDAQ listing. We've got the online products that drive people into land-based facilities. So you can play, you can watch, you can bet, whether you're a traditional sports fan, whether you're a casino fan, whether you're a gamer, we've got a product for you. Uh, we make sure that our strategy allows us to multiply the potential revenue from each client. And we still, even though today and yesterday we've been enjoying quite a bit of joy in the market, uh, we feel there's still move, uh, room for us to move upward. And we are still undervalued uh, compared to our um, uh, relative to our peers. So who's on our team? Well, uh, <laughs> myself, with my background in the gaming industry goes back to the 90s. Uh, so I've been involved with this since Genesis. Uh, Dan March is our CFO. He's got 18 years as a senior member of financial teams working with uh, Barclays and HSBC. And more importantly, for our purposes, he's been the CFO of a gambling company. Uh, he was one of the co-founders of Argyle Entertainment, which is Sport Nation and Red Zone. Stuart Tilley, uh, he got into the gambling sector in 2005. Uh, he is the founder of Flip Sports as well as Argyle Entertainment. He heads up our, our M&A team, brings a wealth of knowledge and expertise. John Brackens comes to us from uh, uh, Blizzard and Activision. He was their uh, network, head of the network operations for them. Uh, and has been the Chief Operations Officer, as you see, at Spark Jumpers and Game Studios. Uh, John is, uh, brings a wealth of expertise, both from the gaming side as well as from the gambling side. Then our, our head of eSports, our Executive Vice President of eSports, is Magnus, I'm going to ruin his last name here, Lipin Yemi. Uh, he got into the gaming industry, uh, video gaming industry, back in 1996, about the same time I got into the gambling industry. Uh, he is well known in the gaming space. Uh, he actually headed up DreamHack's push to bring uh, DreamHack to North America, and all things in our esports portfolio uh, fall under Magnus's uh, jurisdiction. Jeff Cohen, who's got a degree from Harvard and from uh, Columbia Business School, uh, he comes to us from Stevens Bank, and he was one of the top three uh, analysts in the video game and esports sectors. Uh, and joining us, and he heads up, uh, he's a VP of strategy and investor relations. Uh, and Jeff's uh, contact information, quite straightforward, Jeff at Esports Entertainment Group. Uh, that concludes our presentation. Uh, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to do my best to answer them for you. Grant, thank you. And uh, you're in a hot industry, and you have uh, a lot of people who know a lot of gamers. So we are getting quite a few questions, as you can imagine. So why don't we start with, uh, you mentioned about the acquisitions that uh, you haven't closed. Uh, we're getting some questions here about when those acquisitions are going to close. Um, and if you can talk a little bit about uh, the thoughts on debt or equity financing, how that, that's supposed to uh, play out. And then, um, and then there's a couple of follow-ups regarding the M&A activity in 2021-2022. So we'll, we'll, let's hold off on that. Uh, well, the, the EGL is uh, the final documents uh, are done today. Uh, so we have cash in hand. That's a cash and stock transaction. So that one is uh, the VK will be out, I imagine, in the next uh, 48 hours. So that's, that's done. That transaction is complete. We've been running with them for, for several months now. Uh, the Lucky Dino, they should be finished their uh, audit by the end of this month that we'll be able to conclude that. That will be a cash transaction. We've been working closely with our with our underwriters at Max and Gunner and uh, several uh, funds that are quite interested in participating in that. So that transaction will be closing, we imagine, it looks like the first couple weeks of February. Uh, that is a uh, 25 million euro uh, transaction. Uh, it's accretive. It brings about 25 million euros in, uh, in uh, net gaming revenue, and I believe about 4 million media to the uh, to the company. I believe that was in our in the announcement. 
Uh, the bigger transaction is the GD Circuit Helix transaction. Uh, we're moving along quite nicely there. Uh, we expect the audits to finish in mid-February, at which point in time it will go to shareholder vote, and that transaction should close uh, either late March, or early April. It'll be a combination of debt and equity. Uh, everybody on that team is staying in the in the in the operation, so they'll become you know substantial shareholders. Gotcha. And so if you, you know, you're already in kind of like all the, got your fingers in all the pies, everything esports and uh, and uh, and gaming. Can you talk a little bit about your M&A strategy from this point going forward? What, what do you what do you look for? Um, and if maybe just talk a little bit about your appetite to make more acquisitions at this point. Sure. Well, clearly our our desktop is quite full right now. But once we get through this, we've been working closely with the curve. Uh, which is the number one consulting firm in the UK for iGaming. Uh, they have a very full pipeline of uh, very interesting creative uh, opportunities for us. Uh, some in the same weight class as the Lucky Dino, some substantially bigger as we grow the target, uh, the, the targets grow. Our focus on which targets we're looking for, A, we do want them to be creative, of course. B, um, if they've they own or control their own technology, it makes them of greater interest, and see if they're in markets that we're currently not in. So there's, there's, there's a number of synergies that we gain there by being able to cross markets to those. So we do have uh, several others we can pursue once we've completed here. On the esports side, uh, we are interested, but most of the focus on esports, now that we have EGL and we're working with Helix and Genji and GG Circuit, uh, we are interested in unique offerings. You know, some new technology. I would be interested in exploring that. Um, you know, so that uh, we continue to increase unique offerings to our to our customers. But that th those are where the two focuses are. Gotcha. And you know, we another question here is that uh, they were asking if you could compare and contrast esports and the iGaming industries and businesses and which is the bigger opportunity, which has the higher growth rate, which has better long-term uh, margin potential? Well, that, that's, a, that's a fair question. I, I think we can all agree that the iGaming industry is by far the more mature uh, business. It's, I mean, we're 25 years into it now. I can remember at the very beginning, they were not profitable. And, and that was taking uh, a mature industry and bringing it online. The issue at that time was will sports bet players and uh, and uh, casino gamers, will they give a random online operator their credit card? The short answer was no, not for several years. <laughs> and uh, But once people got comfortable with technology, and, and clearly they have, uh, the iGaming industry, oh, I, I think if you're including gray market, it's well over $100 billion. Um, so it's the mature industry. So our fastest ramp up on, on revenues and profits, it's going to come from acquisitions of iGaming, no question. Uh, which market has the most potential for growth? I believe it's the esports market because it's still fairly nascent. I mean, if we look into the United States, I uh, believe when we launched in Jersey, we, if not being the first licensed in the U.S., we'll be one of the first sites in the U.S. Uh, we believe we have potential to capture five, at least 5% of the industry as it matures. And we believe that'll relate to um, about $180 million in revenue once the industry matures over the next five years. So it gives more room for growth. So it's now it's iGaming. In the future, we believe the bigger growth is gonna be in esports. So we're taking action in the now to accelerate our growth into esports. You know, there's a lot of states out there that are going to have huge budget deficits um, given this COVID situation. And one of the uh, viewers asked uh, over the next several months regarding um, your outlook in terms of states passing legislation to offer online sports betting. What are your thoughts? Uh, well, it's not just a state to state. It's a country to country uh, situation. And I think it's fair to say that um, all states are looking for what options they are on the table. And there's no doubt that COVID has accelerated these conversations at the state level. Uh, I believe three years ago, there was three states that had some form of online gaming regulatory body. And today, uh, you know, 
I, I think the Supreme Court ruling came down in 20, the spring of 2018, and here we sit, not even three years later, and now there's over 16 states. Uh, I believe in the conversations I've had over the next couple of years, that number will be closer to 30, 35 states. Uh, it is conceivable that all 50 states will start to look in this direction. I don't see why they wouldn't, because the states where they don't have gaming regulatory bodies in place, it's taking place illegal. And I, I think the, the path of the way we approach this is transparency. We're fans of regulatory environments. Obviously, as an Aztec company, we don't, we don't mess around in black markets. Uh, and we would like to see all the states, and in Canada, all the provinces move in this direction. And we intend to move with it. And Grant, we have another viewer that had interest in your um, professional team partnerships. Um, they were they were asking if you can outline for us some of the teams that uh, uh, that your sports teams that you're working with, um, and then is what is the rough time frame um, for for some of these leagues and any professional athletes that you might be working on or partnering with. If you can just kind of give us some thoughts there. Sure. Uh, well, the first tournament we we're going to have is going to be with the LA Kings. It's going to go live before the end of this month. Uh, and then next month, we'll be doing a tournament with the Philly Union. Well, those will be the first two. Uh, we'll be doing the first tournament with the Eagles around draft season in April. So that's the timeline. Uh, in all cases, it's uh, the, the teams are uh, putting brand ambassadors forward, which are players, the athletes, who actually play in the titles. And of course, at the NHL, they're going to launch with the NHL uh, game with the Philly Union and LA Galaxy. They are going to actually, oddly, be uh, looks like the, the the Philly Union one is going to launch with uh, playing 2K, NBA 2K on it. I think that is, has to do with their ownership structure because KD is one of the owners there. Um, uh, but with regard to the Eagles, they want to start with Matt. Now, that doesn't mean that's where we're going to stay. But that is, they've identified in each respective league, they've identified those are the titles that a large percentage of their fans play, which makes sense because if they're hockey fans, they probably pay the NHL game. And with uh, Galaxy and, and uh, Philly Union, the larger number of their fans do play FIFA. And of course, Madden is, is a big game with, with Philly fans. I think they've identified over 130,000 of their fans play Madden. As important, the members of the team, the athletes themselves, play those games. So part of the athlete's contract, generally speaking, is they've got to go to a number of public appearances, ribbon cuttings, autograph signings. And so we're finding uh, the feedback we're getting from the teams is a lot of the athletes are actually competing with, you know, to be the ambassadors because to them, they get the game. They, they're either going to play the fans or they're going to be the color commentators and the fans or the fans get the chance to play to meet, you know, the players. So the, the fan engagement level is, is, a, is a huge, having the players with the fan engagement, that's a huge part of the marketing component here because this offers the fans an opportunity to win something and experience they can't just buy. You know, you can't just go and buy a dinner with one of the players. you got to win it. And, you know, so that is why we feel very bullish that this is a, a good direction for us to go. And frankly, if we're just looking at the metrics, we only need about one third of 1% of their fans to participate in these tournaments to make them profitable. And that's a fairly reasonable uh, break even point. You know, it's interesting that a lot of colleges are offering scholarships for uh, gaming. Um, so the next question is, uh, he wanted to see your thoughts on collegiate esports and if that's an area of opportunity for you. Well, definitely. Well, GG Circuit currently, I, I believe there's 50. Uh, colleges and universities that run off their software. Uh, and again, five years ago, people would have said, you're crazy if somebody was going to get a scholarship to go to university uh, uh, to play esports. However, here we sit. Uh, there's over, gosh, I, I, I'm going to say there's close to 100 universities and colleges that now offer scholarships uh, to play on their esports teams. So it's a huge growing area. I, I think if we, if we look at, you know, sportsbook, as a comparable, where we believe this is going to go. After Super Bowl, it's March Madness is the number two betting event uh, in, in, uh, in sports betting, I believe. And it stands to reason that as these collegiate, intercollegiate teams start to grow and get you know, more 
the history behind them, uh, I see that as being a huge area of growth. Absolutely. Um, both for the players and the number of schools that will be participating, but for the fans, because if the fans graduate and they go up, they will no doubt go back and follow the teams that they used to play on, same as they do in traditional sports. Absolutely. This uh, viewer's question um, actually is a very interesting one um, that obviously there's very explosive growth in iGaming and eSports. The question is um, whether or not, and, and much of those platforms run off of a blockchain technology, and the question is in terms of looking at um, iGaming platforms with blockchain tech, uh, technology, is are you looking at tokens and crypto, non-fungible digital assets as well as you look at growing your platform? Well, you know, this is, and this conversation is constantly evolving, of course. You know, as, as it pertains to using blockchain for any of the platforms, I leave that to the, the programmers over at Flip and, and GG Circuit to integrate and, and grow their uh, the platforms to make sure the product is what the, what the players want. When it comes to crypto, there's no question. I think I heard a, a commercial the other day that um, Bitcoin has been the highest performing asset for the last 10 years, which is a bit mind-blowing if you think of it. It's based roughly on nothing, just a common belief that, uh, that it, it has value, a stored value. Uh, that said, as you can appreciate, a lot of the regulatory bodies and the traditional banks are not what you would call fans of uh, you know, a lot of the crypto offerings out there. We're constantly monitoring it. Uh, we are monitoring it, excuse me. We have uh, several people dedicated just to online payment strategies uh, where we can integrate it in jurisdictions where it is looked upon favorably. Uh, and, and, it, it, and that too is a constantly changing environment. The one thing about gaming and gambling is the environment is constantly evolving. Uh, I believe that uh, the banks will start to offer their own version of crypto um, when they do, and in jurisdictions where we're able to, absolutely we'll offer it. Because from our perspective, uh, we want to give, however the fans want to populate their betting account, we want to give them that option. Uh, when we hit a certain critical mass, will we offer our own token? Probably, yes. Uh, when will that be? I'll get back to you next year, later this year. <laughs> awesome. And uh, another question is that uh, Bally's obviously partnered with Sinclair Broadcasting as a way to, you know, gain recognition and exposure for their brand. you have any discussions with other media companies to help increase your exposure? Uh, again, the conversations are constants and ever, ever changing. I, I mean, this time last year, there was 14 people in this company. Uh, now there's over 70. And that brings 70 people's contacts, relationships, and conversations to the table. And they're across payments, programming, tournament operation, you know, sports book, casino, everything. And so, yes, uh, we constantly have conversations with uh, uh, sites that we can do streaming on, sites that want to you know, joint venture with us to share content. We deal with Bally's. That's who we have our skin from in New Jersey. We deal with Harris Blitzer in New Jersey, by far the biggest sporting organization in New Jersey. Uh, AEG out, uh, you know, Kings and um, uh, Kings and Galaxy, yeah, and, and part owners of the Lakers at the Staples Center. So we, we constantly are talking about content and partnerships and how that we can accelerate our brand, and our brand awareness by working with and that really is one of the driving factors behind these, these big sports franchises. They have the fans. They have the credibility. They have the quality relationship. We're giving them what they don't have. They're giving us. They're our marketing partners. Uh, so we look for all those opportunities all the time. And, and like I said, Bally's is, uh, is a good example. And we do deal with Bally's. I speak with them weekly. And, and as you kind of just look at the landscape, I'm, I'm really excited about the Helix um, acquisition. I think that's a really interesting platform. Um, and I, as we look at this pandemic and on the backside of the pandemic, do you have any thoughts in terms of when we might start seeing in-person tournament play, you know, filling stadiums again and kind of really broaden out the, the exposure to this? Uh... 
Well, part. I mean, that's a that too is a is, is a constantly evolving conversation. I mean, just turn on any channel and, and, and they, they're talking about COVID. Uh, I know the NFL believes that they'll be fully back in the stands by the fall season, uh, and so they expect that full stadiums. If if I'm Interpreting the news correctly, uh, I, it looks like uh, the U.S. plans to hit that critical mass of uh, vaccinations late this spring, early summer, at which point in time, normal, whatever that is, will, will be reintroduced. Uh, I can say that even uh, you know, with Helix, and I'm glad you brought it up, I, they're very innovative. And this is one of the reasons why we're pretty excited about this, uh, this transaction. They've been able to operate pretty close to break even even operate at 25% capacity. And they do that through food and bev and some pretty creative ways that they run their software and the machines are working even when people aren't playing on. That definitely bodes well for getting back to normal late this spring and summer. Uh, so turning that from break even to highly profitable is going to happen. And I can tell you, all the pro teams are talking about how do they work with esports and bring it in. And all we have to do is point to Patriot Place right there. It's a textbook model. We want that in every stadium across North America. Yeah. Well, Grant, that's uh, all that we have time for. Thank you for your story. Uh, what a great and exciting company and in industry. Thank you. Thank you for having me.